to talk to you about the pathway to the supernatural. And I want to talk to you about it because it's super important and close to tomorrow. I'm going to lay the foundation right now. Just a few scriptures out of the New Testament. John 14, verse 12. This scripture changed my life in 1986. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Did you know it's possible for you to do greater works? Jesus could only be one place at one time, and now the Holy Spirit is invested in you. John chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, Jesus is talking here, says when he, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And down to verse 27 from the cha same chapter, Jesus says, look, I'm not just telling you a story and analogy here. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is a chapter all about you know, different kinds of gifts of the Spirit. Romans 12 talks about the motivational gifts of the Spirit, Why, what your personality is like, how God kind of shaped and formed you. Ephesians 4 talks about the ministry gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and how the leaders in our lives in, in spiritual things are called and placed in the body. But 1 Corinthians 12 is about the manifested gifts of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural gifts of God. And I think a lot of times we kind of miss some stuff here because 1 Corinthians 12, when I read from the Amplified, says this. Now about the spiritual gifts, the special endowments of supernatural energy. I love that. Brethren, I do not want you to be misinformed. One translation says ignorant. Skip down to verse 7, still from the Amplified. <clears throat> but to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the evidence, the spiritual illumination of the Spirit for good and for the profit of all. Let's pray together one more time. God, would you open the eyes of our heart? Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Jesus, we lift up your name and we honor you in this congregation and in Seward. Lord, we ask you to envelop us in your presence today and empower us with your life in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the supernatural is kind of controversial at times, even in the body of Christ. And here we have this admonition, don't be ignorant about the gifts of the Spirit. Don't be ignorant of the things that God wants to do. And yet we are... Right now, in our country even, there's more people that claim Christ that are biblically illiterate and especially spiritually illiterate. And yet the admonition is don't be ignorant, don't be misinformed, get some understanding of these things because God wants to empower each one, each one. Are you part of each? If, if you read the Bible and it says every, does that, so, do you find an exclusion there for you? If he says everyone, each one, then it's not just excluding you. It's not, and, and so my tagline, I've, I've just, I, I just started writing and working on this message. I preached it last Sunday in my church and kind of modified it for you a bit. But here's what I, what I believe about the supernatural. I believe the world is craving the supernatural. But they're looking at all the wrong sources because we're dormant. We're dormant. We're quiet. We're ashamed. We're afraid or we're ignorant. And so they're looking in witchcraft and occult and new age and all this stuff, you know. They're looking for hocus pocus and horoscope and everything else. And I say this, you don't need to be superman, super spiritual, or superficial. You just need to be super natural. My fr a friend of mine, Tim Story, used to say this, uh, the supernatural is simply when God's super gets into your natural. When his power, his strength, <clears throat> fills imperfect vessels. And I submit to you, if the church of Jesus won't take the supernatural power of God into the world, people will keep seeking other sources. Let's redefine the word ministry for a moment, okay? 
Because the problem is, when we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, we kind of correlate that with famous preachers or TV preachers or people that we've seen that move in the supernatural. We say, well, I could never do that. But here's the problem. The Bible doesn't say that. It says, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, Jesus said, they'll cast out demons. Wait a minute, isn't that the pastor's job? No, no. No, no, no. See, we've got to redefine ministry. Because what, what we've had, and this is, this, is, this is a big part of my passion, my soapbox right now in this season. We have a wrong definition of fivefold ministry, especially pastors. You know, when I was coming up, if you felt the call of God, you automatically were put into one of three categories, pastor, evangelist, or missionary. And yet the Bible says that every Christian has a ministry. But we look at TV shows. There was an old show years ago called Seventh Heaven. We'd watch it with our family. It was a little bit, you know, it was a pastor's family. But that guy, he was an idiot. He was, every show, he's like going to get uh, Mrs. Dunn's vitamin pills and had to go this, per- he's running errands. He was like an errand boy. And he used to shout at the TV, he said, stop that. You're hurting your church. Because you're doing everything and you're allowing this. See, see, when I say you don't need to be Superman, it's because I believe that we've set this pedestal, this impossible vision of pastoring to be something that's not biblical. I call him clergyman. <laughs> clergyman. Are you a layman or a clergyman? Because clergyman is faster than a speeding bullet more powerful than a locomotive, can build tall churches in a single bound. But the body of Christ is the expression of Jesus. We don't need just a bunch of heads or hands running around. Remember the Adams family, the hand that just kept running around? The thing, was it thing? Thing. That's the body of Christ today. We got things running all around, lone rangers, uncovered, unconnected, displaced, offended professionally, and they don't know how to get through. So I want to redefine ministry as this. To me, ministry is using all of your God-given talents, abilities, and resources to serve others, to fulfill the divine assignment and purpose for which you were born. Can we agree, can, can we at least agree that that's a, that's a viable Definition for the word ministry, is that okay? Is that okay with you and Seward? I want, I want you to know that. See, be, because here, if that's it, then you're that. If that's it, then you're that. You have no excuse because ministry is about serving with your talents, abilities, gifts, and, and the things that God has invested in you. <clears throat> so in my final few moments, we're going to talk about the meaning of life. I'm going to give you the meaning of life. Isn't that awesome? Biggest question people have, why am I here? Who am I? Why am I here, right? C.S. Lewis said that the fact that we were born wanting to find meaning and purpose is one of the great proofs that God is real and that the Bible is his love letter of discovery to humanity. Because all of humanity is born wanting to know why. If we were just evolving from amoebas, why would we think why? Is it, it doesn't matter. I mean, do you think your dog actually considers its purpose? Man's best friend, why am I here? He ignores me all day. They leave me alone. They come home, I show them how excited I am. What's my reason for existing? They don't. It's human created in the image of God. Are you getting that? So I believe one of the great deceptions of the enemy is to try to make Christ followers believe that most people are closed off to Jesus because it, it bears our purpose. So, so if, I, if, I have pre, if I have preconceived everybody in my office or my workplace to be not interested, or worse yet, a persecutor, or no, that, that person. And, and so we pre-qualify people, don't we? 
We judge them based on what they did, what they said, little digs. I want to tell you something. Sometimes the biggest mouthy people against Christians in your workplace are the actual, actually the one God's dealing with, and they're the next to fall. They're the next to come to church. But, you, but they, they use that as a, <clears throat> I'm not interested. No, I'm not interested. Many times, most times, it's a lie. How do I know? Because in high school, I was the guy, I was the Presbyterian kid teasing all the charismatic kids and all the kids that were really, there was a revival in Orlando, Florida, near where I grew up. And um, in a church called Calvary Assembly. And the youth group became a thousand young people. And a bunch of people from my high school and even from my Presbyterian church started going there getting saved. And I used to tease the holy rollers, the Jesus freaks. And then at 19 years old, I became one. By the time I went to my 10th year high school reunion at the age of 28, Somebody found out I was a pastor at a large spirit-filled church in Orlando, Florida, pastored by Benny Hinn, and I was the youth pastor, and I went to my 10th year high school reunion, and they asked me to open the dinner with grace. When I got up to pray, there was laughter, and there was a commotion. And after that time, a a lady named Lisa Hughes that I knew from high school came up and said, I am so sorry. I caused that commotion. I didn't know you were a pastor. She said, you remember when you used to tease me on the bus? Remember when you used to talk to me about being a Christian, call me a holy roller? I said, yeah, I do. She goes, well, I prayed for you every time. And she said, I didn't even know you're a Christian. She said, when somebody said you were going to get up and lead prayer, she said, I started to laugh uncontrollably. She said, when they said you were a youth pastor at Benny Hinn's church, I fell off my chair laughing <clears throat> because I realized God had a sense of humor. <laughs> I'm just telling you that the, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But So, so we got to stop pre-screening with our own minds, did you appear open just before you opened up to God? Probably not. Did you, say, did you put out a big sign? Somebody invite me to church. Somebody lead me. I've got questions. You probably were a little bit more surly, angry, questioning yourself and God in those moments. So we got to get past this because here's the deal. And i got to get to the meat of the message. But Jesus said if you look around right now, you'd see that the field's already ripe for harvest. So I want to give you a thought today. Because this this came as a shock to me recently as I was just spending time with God. Listen to this. This is is profound yet just, just simple thought. We don't have a harvest problem. We have a labor shortage. You hear me? We don't have a harvest problem. We have a labor shortage. Right now, all over America, there are jobs that are open, and nobody's taking the job. There are people that would rather stay home and collect money from the government to do nothing than actually go work, and they don't realize that it's killing them on the inside. Because it's not about income. It's about doing what God created you to do. And Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. I'm just having, I'm having trouble finding anybody that would go and share. The problem, let me say it this way. The problem, the biggest problem is not them. It's us. Pray the Lord of the harvest seed, send laborers. Are you willing to be a gospel worker yourself or do you want clergyman to do it? You want clergyman to do, to do all the praying? Do you want a clergyman to, to minister healing when people are sick? Do you want a clergyman to go to the hospital visitations? You're going to stay a very small church if you do that. Because clergyman isn't the answer. Jesus is the answer. And Jesus said, greater works will you do. You do. You. You and you 
and you, you do. Greater works. Now, do we believe it or not? See, that's the question because it's in the Bible. Now, if you want to tear it out of the Bible, we'll have a discussion about that too. But greater works will you do because I go to the Father. That's what Jesus said. And the whole rest of John 14 is about the Holy Spirit. I got to get to it. Let me, let me just say this. I was, uh, we, we live near a, a big national forest, Ocala National Forest. And there are always times where the dry season where we get some fires. I'm driving through last year, and I look over at a pine forest that had burned the previous season, and there's all these new seedlings in straight lines. And I thought, isn't that great? As soon as there's a fire, the forestry people must come right out and just plant these new forests. Isn't that cool? And I mentioned to somebody, they said, no, no, that's not what happens. I said, really? They said, look at a pine cone. They said, what you don't realize is the pine cone, all of those little things sticking out are seeds. And he said, when there's a fire in a forest, the pine cone heats up and becomes a seed grenade for the next generation of pine trees. I never heard this. Some of you in horticulture, you probably think, duh, don't you know that? I didn't know that. I thought little people were going out there and, oh, let's do a plant here. Let's do a tree there. It's because if you look, they're, they're lined up. But it's because they're lined up because God has created that every time the pine cone gets heated up to a certain point, it explodes with new seed to replace what has burned down. And I thought, dear God, I got this thought of, I call it collateral grace. You ever heard of collateral damage? When you bomb somebody and innocent people get killed, right? This church is filled with collateral grace. When, when Paul and Silas sang praises to God in the Philippian jail, the Bible said an earthquake hit and all the doors opened. And everybody walked free. That's collateral grace. That's collateral grace. So what happens when you go through COVID? It's a fire. What do you do on the other side of it? You explode with seed. Because I'll tell you what, even stubborn people right now, through COVID, realize they don't know everything. And they don't have the answers. And they're actually wondering about stuff that we actually have answers to. Because of the word of God. That's why the Bible says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you when people ask. Peter wrote that. He said, you just be ready to answer the question. I'm not saying, here's the one I'm not advocating. Ministry is not you going to work and putting a giant Bible and concordance on your desk. And showing everybody how spiritual you are. And showing up late because you had to go prayer to prayer. And leaving early because you got to get to church. Nobody cares what you think, though. I'm talking about Holy Ghost influence that makes people say to you, man, you're, you're like one of the best employees here. You're one of the most creative. You're always five minutes early. You always stay five minutes late. You're always interested in others. When, when the sky is falling and the world's collapsing, you don't seem to freak out. You seem steady. Even in, in your downtime, you seem steady. My friend, it's time for collateral grace. And then there are these spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has distributed to you to mobilize within your sphere of influence. And it's not difficult. When I say supernatural, I'm telling you, you're supposed to mobilize in your sphere of influence just being yourself. When I say supernatural, God's super in your natural, how hard is it for you just to be you? Not religious you. Not carnal you. Just you. Here's the other problem, and I don't have time to talk about this, but a lot of people don't know who they are. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
Old things have passed away. All things have become new. My friends, you were born for the supernatural, and it's not difficult. So how do you tap in the flow of the Holy Spirit to activate his gifts to benefit others? I'm going to give you three things, and then we'll be done. Number one, number one, tune in to the voice of God. Now, I realize we've got people here of all ages, but there are very few that are as old as I am. I realize that, and I'm cool with it. I've made my peace. I can't change my age any more than I can change my skin tone. Can't change it. But here's the deal. When I was a kid in the 60s, we had AM radio, all we had. Some of you don't know what it is. It's okay. <laughs> it sucked. Just to be honest with you, it sucked. It was bad. You had to manually, I know this is hard, but you had to actually turn a knob. There was no button. You, you turned a knob, and, 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 and it went. And it, you'd hear, <laughs> until you found, oh, no, 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 no. And, and, and the, weird part about, the weird part about AM radio was in Florida, in Orlando, Florida area, on a, on a cool night in Florida in the winter, we could pick up Atlanta or Havana on AM radio. But you had to really find that station, and then it would move on you. FM came along, and there was no static at all. That's what Steely Dan said. There was no static at all. And so, but you still had to, when you found the station, you still had to kind of, it still might move on you. you. You'd find it, but you still had to tune it in. You might have to change it after, after listening to the radio for an hour. You might have to change it, just, just adjust. God wants us to tune in to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of Jesus. You have to tune in. Some folks think that the Christian claim to hear the voice of God is an hallucination, wishful thinking, or just plain old crazy nuts. But Jesus promised that his own people would be able to discern his voice and listen to it. And it wouldn't necessarily be in our ears. So how do we hear from God? We've got to, we've got to, the, the Bible says, incline your ear unto God's sayings. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Bend your ear. When, you know, when somebody's talking to you and there's a crowded room, sometimes you, you, you lean in. You lean in. You have to lean in. And I found that during COVID, there was so much stuff going on. You had to, I had to actually just purpose in my heart just to lean in a little bit more to make sure I was hearing God, hearing him clearly. As in the case of Elijah, remember Elijah goes out to the mountain and he's looking for God, wants to hear from God, and there's an earthquake hits. Remember that? And God went in an earthquake. There's a, there's a wind, a tornadic wind. Whoosh. God's not in the wind. Then the Bible says there's a fire and, and God's not in the fire. I, I take that to mean that God wasn't necessarily a fan of earth, wind, and fire. But <laughs> three people remember earth, wind, and fire. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, those of you... Those of you children of the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know what I'm talking about. Do you remember? No, I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. He's looking for God in all the dramatic stuff. And then God speaks inside of him in a still small voice. And he wraps his head in his coat and he leans in. That's what I'm talking about. So I want to say this to you. The supernatural is not always in the spectacular. When I say supernatural, you think I'm talking about having a healing service that you're conducting. That's not what I'm talking about. But can you pray for somebody that's sick? Can you, can you, could you actually pray for somebody that's sick? Now, you can bring them to church. You can get Pastor Carrie to pray for them. She has a special anointing of healing. That's great. But maybe you do too. She's not clergy girl. She's Pastor Carrie. Sometimes God speaks in a whisper. And I want to say it this way. Our Lord does not like to compete with all the noise of the world. God will not compete. What I had to learn during some of the toughest times of COVID, and for us, the racial stuff hit it, and we're a church that's 
almost half black and half white. We almost had race wars in our own church of people presupposing each other's heart motives. Well, if you don't say this, you must be that. Uh, Hey, I'm sorry. No, no, no. We're not doing that here. Mask, no mask. Vaccine, no vaccine. Republican, Democrat, independent. We're not, we're not going for, listen, we're not going for elephants and we're not going for donkeys. We're going for, we're going for sheep. We're, go, we're going for souls. We're going for people. That's exactly the plan of the enemy, to divide us all and cause us, you know, you know when they say judge not lest you be judged, it's talking about judging other people's heart motives. Only God knows the heart, right? Man looks at outward appearance. God looks at the heart. We had a nation, a world last summer of everybody judging everybody else's heart motive. Because if you said this or did that, no. See, we, we forgot something called nuance. Nuance simply means more than one thing can be true at the same time. It's not this or that, us versus them. But I had to learn this the hard way. There were moments I just had to turn the TV off. There were months on, a, on end during COVID that I didn't watch the news. Because I was getting so, I was seeing my parents get so freaked out about the news. They're like, they're like hanging on every word that they said on Fox News Channel. They said, oh, and then, did you hear this? Did you hear that? I'm like, no. No, no, no. Because my heart isn't in that. In fact, I'm, I'm not even of that. I'm of Christ. And Christ in me is the hope of glory. And if I don't stir up the gifts of God within me, then it's going to affect a lot of other people. I got I to gotta quit in two minutes. Let's go to number two. I got more to say, but let's go to number two. Number two is simply this. Get to know his voice. Get to know his voice. When I say tune into his voice, that's one thing. But when I say get to know his voice, in order to respond, you have to recognize. In order to respond, you have to recognize. So Jesus said, my sheep will recognize my voice. And if they can recognize it, then they can activate. They can, they can do what I said. They can, they, can, they can sense it. They can hear it. They can know. God always speaks his word, a now word consistent with kingdom truth. God cannot contradict himself. He cannot give you a special revelation that is extra biblical or anti biblical. God can only speak according to the consistencies of his kingdom values that are released in his holy word. Here's the problem the devil knows the Bible too. When he faced Jesus, he quoted scripture to the living word. But here's the deal the devil has pretzel logic. The devil twists. He takes a scripture, but he twists it every time. He just puts a pretzel little twist on it. So you can't understand that it's actually deceptive. But Jesus plainly spoke, no, it is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We live by that. Get to know his voice. The enemy always twists things into extremes of permissiveness and or condemnation. And the weird part is he can give you permissiveness and condemnation in the exact same moment. You can feel free and bound in the enemy in the exact same moment because you think your freedom is to do whatever you want, and that's not freedom at all. The Holy Spirit speaks to us with love and intimacy. I find that when people t- describe how God talks to them, it reveals a lot about their view of God. I've, I've had pastor friends I've heard preaching, and, and I'm not trying to down anybody, but I've had pastor friends say, yeah, the Lord spoke to me the other day and said, hey, dummy, what are you doing? Hey, you, you, oh, that was dumb. Yeah, you, hey, you idiot. I'm thinking like, I've never once had God call me dummy or idiot. G.K. Chesterton said, if you want to know your, your future, Tell me what your view of God is. What's the first thing you think about when I say God? Because if you think he's a punisher just waiting to beat you every time you mess up, you need freedom today. Because the God that would do that, why would he send his own son to take all your punishment? 
See, we get these wrong pictures, wrong concepts of God. And I want to say, your Father's voice is strong, it is mighty, and it is also empowering. Finally, number three and last. I'm winding up here. This is simply it. So you got to hear the voice of God. you gotta, you got to tune into that voice. you got to get to know that voice. And number three, to get to move in the supernatural, to simply be a vessel of God's power in the supernatural, all you have to do is boldly follow the unction of God. What's the unction of God, Pastor? What's the unction of God? Anybody have a, anybody have a, a smart watch, Apple watch, or whatever the other brands are? There's something called haptics. Several times a day, my, my watch goes and says, do you want to rest now and take a few moments to breathe? Or it says, uh, 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 um, garage door just went up. It's on my watch. There's a little nudge. There's a little tap, tap. And I'm telling you, if you belong to Jesus Christ, and you've been filled with the power of his spirit, there's a little tap, tap. There's a little tap, tap. And it's not, God's not going to shout. He's not going to scream. He's not going to compete with your noise. There's going to be a little tap, tap when somebody is going through something and God wants you to simply pay attention, have compassion, say hello to a complete stranger. Tap, tap. That's the unction of God. And that's the unction of the supernatural. And we make it so hard. Oh, if God, God, if that's you, I want 20 confirmations. The person's gone. You missed your moment. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4, 13, that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the boldness, what they see? They saw boldness. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and, the, and they realized that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they weren't trained. They were in awe because they realized that they had been with Jesus. If I could train you how to hear the voice of God and how to recognize it, that'd be great, but it wouldn't be enough. Without you having a spirit of boldness. I prayed a really dangerous prayer when I was in my 20s. I said, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll say anything you want me to say. I'll do anything you want me to do. Just send me. Just use me. Then I found myself during COVID saying, God, I feel so used. (laughs) Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me to to the people that need you in my neighborhood, at the grocery store, in the restaurant, at work. Let me be a vessel of the supernatural. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for Mercy City Church and for what it means to us. Thank you for the spirit of boldness coming upon the people of this house. Now, right now, I take authority over every spirit of confusion. Lord, your word says you're not the author of confusion, but the author of peace. So release your presence and we release your holy power right now. I ask you to reveal Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to those who are on the fringe or those who are outside looking in. Maybe someone's here today or in the Seward campus, and maybe you just don't know. You just don't know. You don't, you, maybe you know about him, and you've come because you're interested in him, but maybe you don't know him. You haven't encountered Jesus. You haven't really experienced him, and so you don't know that supernatural tap-tap, that, that touch, that voice that strength, that love, that caress, that, that, that open arms that a father has when a child comes home. Many of you don't know why you're here, what you're doing, what your purpose is. I want to say right now that the beginning of everything is that moment where you cross from death to life. The greatest supernatural miracle is not healing. The greatest supernatural miracle is not being set free from demons. That's, that, that's real, and it's available, and you can find that. But the very beginning, the biggest miracle is that you can pass as a, as a person who's spiritually dead, and you can come into life by simply turning the switch on in your own heart and saying yes. We sang that song earlier I'm talking about being available, being ready. 
God wants, do you want our heart, God? Yes, I want your heart. If you're here today, or you're watching, I invite you right now to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. This is the beginning of a supernatural life and not just an existence. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, you know what? There's a, Jesus would give people a, a, a prophetic action. He'd, he said to the, to the, to, to the lepers, okay, you, you have faith. Oh, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. He said to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. There's always a corresponding action of faith for you to do something to activate the supernatural. So right now, if you want, to, want Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, I want you to put your hand up right now and keep it up. Just put it up right now. Don't even, don't even hesitate. Don't let your mind talk to you out of what your heart knows. Just right now, hands are going up all over the place. Father, reveal yourself, Jesus. Everybody in the room that has your hand up, in fact, everybody just say this out loud. Just say, Jesus, I want more of you. I want to know you in a real way. Come and fill my life. Change me. Fill me with your power. Show me my ministry. Stir me up and fill me with your love. Forgive me of my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. If you meant that prayer right there, if you meant that prayer right there, I'm telling you, God is going to meet you at your point of faith. And I'm praying that if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe those of you that are newer, that you'll begin to seek God and say, God, I want everything you have. It's a dangerous prayer. Dangerous prayer. I want everything you have. Because we come with preconceived notions. I want everything you have but except this. I heard this is weird. That's the way me and my wife were as Presbyterians. I, I want everything you have. Yes, yes, yes. Except, well, I don't, I don't really like that one because that's, that one, now that people think I was weird if I did that one. Boldness to overcome everything else. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise right now. Come on, Pastor Brock.